Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon for our half an hour webinar. Basically, uh, it's just a sort of a fairly simple, straightforward introduction to Zizel's Wi-Fi 6 solutions in terms of access points and the necessary switch support you need. Um, as it says on here, uh, basically, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, features of Wi-Fi 6 are aiming to more than just improved speed, but also to have more smooth and consistent and fast connections. If you could just give me another sort of 30 seconds or so to let the last few people that are joining, I can see joining on the GoToWebinar control panel, and then I'll um, get started. Thank you very much indeed. Cool. So that looks like most people have now joined. So welcome, and we get going. So obviously, everyone's aware now that uh, literally Wi-Fi is every, everywhere. Literally, literally, you know, in the streets, at home, offices. When we used to go in there, everywhere. So basically, there's some stats that we were given by our marketing department, basically, which shows that the average user checks their phone. 85, 85 times a day, how, how that relates to five hours, I'm not quite sure, but we'll let the marketing people answer that. And obviously the number of devices nowadays that are connected via uh, a wireless connection is, is in the billions. And ultimately, obviously people's expectations are that that will just continue to increase, uh, not so much exponentially, but you know, fairly linearly as more and more devices get connected to the internet. So how are we, you know, how are we going to achieve that when we expect that that connectivity to literally be everywhere, as this slide shows? So we have to say hospitals or restaurants, cafes, any anywhere hospitality when it eventually opens. Obviously, education is a is a huge market for us and for obviously for yourselves as retailers. And the retail space as well in terms of doing Wi-Fi uh, for end users, but also um, analytics for Wi-Fi. So where do people stop? What do they look at? So on and so forth. So literally, Wi-Fi itself, the original specs have been around now for a while, and obviously people have got used to the fact that uh, the specifications move on in time. And also there was some confusion wasn't there, over the years in terms of the different versions of Wi-Fi specs. And so the Wi-Fi, one of the main Wi-Fi marketing organizations created a number for the, for the revision of Wi-Fi. So now we're at Wi-Fi 6, but in fact it's, uh, 802.11ax, some people refer to it as high efficiency wireless LAN, <clears throat> but I believe to refer to it properly as Wi-Fi wi 6, you need to have Wi-Fi 6 branding and so on and so forth. There's a lot of people refer to it as AX Wi-Fi. So where, where, what, uh, what are the sort of features of the specification? So some of these numbers on here are theoretical, and I would, I would, I would state that they are theoretical maximums. So obviously much higher uh, theoretical top speeds. Larger capacity due to some specific coding schemes, which we'll come to in a minute. It still continues to operate on the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz bands, but it does make far greater uh, use of those of those bands, particularly the 5 gigahertz band. So some parts of the specification are that it now goes up to 8 times 8 in the uh, MIMO in terms of number of receivers and transmitters, that would have to be a very, very high end device. These are maximums. So realistically, we're still at the two by two, three by three, and some people are supporting four by four. One of the other important areas is, is, a, is, a, is a coding scheme, which I've given the links to the actual proper specs and, and articles for Wikipedia later on. It's basically what's called orthogonal frequency division, multiple access. And these are coding schemes that allow much finer grained access and much more efficient use of the bandwidth of the of the airtime bandwidth. There are some also some other uh, interesting features. One of which is called resource uh, unit share scheduling. So there's some nice drawings up uh, later on that show you what that actually translates to. High modulation rates, which is basically another uh, part of OFDMA, but coding basically to make sure that you uh, use the uh, uh, the spectrum that much more efficiently. So how many bits can you get through a particular part of the, of the, of the frequency of the channel, basically? There's another uh, uh, clever feature called um, BSS um, frame coloring. 
very interesting feature. And there's another feature called target wake up time, which is to help uh, try and create lower uh, lower power devices and not waste the bandwidth so much. Sorry, not the bandwidth, but the um, the battery power. So where do some of the, what's the actual sort of real world translation of some of those features? So on the left hand side, we've got the, the you know, the Wi-Fi version, which some people refer to as four and five, and then their, their, their uh, IEEE 802.11 spec name. And then you've got their maximum theoretical speeds and then their connectivity and their connectivity under higher channel widths as well. So you can see that we've gone from um, a theoretical maximum of 600 megabits on the 802.11n up to, as I said, what well, it's a theoretical 10 gig. It's not going to be near that. So it's, it's really, in some respects, it's a typical marketing thing. But you can see how it's gone up substantially from hundreds of megabits to multiple gigabits. And then you can see the connectivity under, uh, from, from a two by two point of view, with an 80 megahertz channel width, 100 meg to 1.2 gig. With four by four, you've gone up from 600 to 2.4 gigs. So you can see that those are more like realistic improvements. There are some um, interesting figures coming up as well. So these are more of a sort of a technical table where you can show and discuss with customers uh, mm -hmm. the differences between uh, the specification, the channel widths that are supported, what that actually translates to in terms of data rates, um, and so on and so forth. Now you can see that things like symbol sizes and one of the one of the very um, digital signal processing specific improvements is the highest modulation rate. So you've gone from what's called 64 quadrature and the tube modulation up to 1024. And this is the using the spectral efficiency that much more as a result of you know basically having more silicon, more digital signal processing, broader channels. You can see that as you go up from the earlier specs, people have um, put in um, features where you can uh, group channels together. So normally the channel width is 20 megahertz. You can make it 40 megahertz, 80 megahertz. And now in um, 802.11 AX, you've got a 160 megahertz channel width. Um, the FFT sizes, they are what's called fast Fourier transform. So once again, this is all to do with digital signal processing. And you can see that the more processing you can do, the greater the sizes that can be supported. And this all ultimately translates to higher throughputs, practical throughputs in terms of airtime. One of the things that is very sophisticated, and I'm not going to pretend that I fully understand it, and that's why I've put the wiki, the Wikipedia um, links further on, is what's called orthogonal frequency division, multiple access. And these are very high-end coding schemes, which normally um, in previous um, translation, tra sorry, transitions of the of the spec. You had individual users having entire um, channels um, allocated to them, whereas with the modern standards, multiple access and the colours are trying to show that those users that need higher bandwidth uh, have, are allocated it. You can see like the red users, but it's a much finer grained, and this is where that earlier phrase resource units comes into it. So resource units and the channel width is divided up and given out to, as it says, multiple access. So it's a way that a user that requires more bandwidth can be given more, more bandwidth. A user that doesn't require that bandwidth, rather than them hogging it, it can be given over to other users. But this requires very sophisticated digital signal processing, which is effectively what's gone into these new modern chipsets that have only really recently been fully um, released and, and fully implement 802.11ax this year. There's another interesting slide which tries to help show what's going on. So whereas before you had a 20 megahertz channel and only one device could go down it, why they chose a space shuttle, I don't know, I suppose it's a good drawing. Then when you've got a much finer grained resource unit based control, as he says here, you've got the concept of thousands of individual units of, of transmission data. You can you could think about it going into a tunnel. So it's an interesting slide. Not quite sure it works, but there you go. I'll let you decide on that. Then we move on to our range of um, AX access points that have been released throughout the year and that are now fully available. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, on the on the left hand side, you've got our Nebula Flex style access points. All of these access points are Nebula capable, but the the NWA ones are what we class as um, Nebula Flex. So you can see their uh, antenna arrangements and then transmitter and receivers, the two by two, so on and so forth. 
One thing you do need to keep an eye on is the, the wired connectivity um, speed, so the LAN connection. So our initial access point, the NWA 110AX, is, is a two by two across both bands, and it is also still a one gigabit ethernet wired connection. When you go up to the NWA 210AX, you'll note that the five gigahertz band goes up to four by four on the transmitters and the receivers. Now that has a corresponding increase in throughput. So if you didn't have a higher speed wired connection, you, it's, it's pointless going for these higher end devices. So this NWA 210AX requires what's called a multi gigabit switch. That's why the 2.5 gigabit ethernet port is, is in bold. So the devices that have 2.5 gigabit ethernet or five gigabit ethernet are multi gigabit switch requiring devices. So that's an example of the combination of the access point and the switch, which we'll show in a minute is, is a significant choice. The, uh, the WAX devices are slightly more higher end and therefore sort of value added retailers uh, or service providers. So the first one, the 510D is a device that we call the dual optimized antenna. And people that are aware of this is quite a clever design of the antenna. You can mount these devices horizontally or vertically, and I'll show you this in a minute. So the difference between the, uh, the 510D and the 610D, once again, is the, the number of transmit receivers on the five gigahertz band. So the first is two by two, and then the 610 goes up to four by four. Once again, that has a corresponding throughput requirement, and that's why you need a 2.5 gig multi-gig port on the 610. Our highest end device is what's called the WAX650S. And this is what our device that comes with what's called a smart antenna. It also comes with Bluetooth and an extra scanning radio as well. This is fully four by four on both bands. And the end result of this is that it's, it's throughput requires a five gigabit uh, multi-gig port. Now you can see that uh, it also talks about a Nebula Flex Pro. So all of these WAX devices come with a Nebula professional license or one year network professional license. Right, the next slide is just showing you uh, what we mean by the dual optimized antenna. So basically it has a ceiling or a wall mounted option. So when it's mounted on the ceiling, that's the kind of transmission pattern. When it's mounted on the wall, you've got a, 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 a an adjusted transmission pattern, which is perhaps slightly better seen on the lower right hand side. If we go back, you'll see that when it's on the ceiling, that's the kind of radiated pattern. So you would have transmission between floors. In the appropriate wall mounted position that removes that interference because basically the antenna transmission pattern is changed to work across floors properly. Our smart antenna, which is the highest end one, this is an example of a so-called non-smart. So it's just an access point and it's transmitting a signal. So if you've got uh, devices around or, or other, uh, like a microwave, whatever, you can get what's called co-channel interference. And obviously that breaks out and covers the um, access points transmission space. And what happens with the smart antenna is it knows about the type of connectivity and it tries to adjust the pattern to trend to to connect to so it to adjust the pattern to transmit to the client. And you'll see this in a minute when it draws. Okay. And it does this in real time across all the individual patterns. It has a, a huge number of optimized antenna patterns and it chooses the appropriate pattern to give optimal connectivity to the client device. Um, and this is repeated because obviously the devices, the client devices can move around a lot. But the end result of this kind of device is that if you've got any kind of interference, you can put these devices in there. You can have a high number of devices as well. And it literally takes care of all the issues. Um, so these are <clears throat> heavily used in uh, education. So you can have like a, a device in each classroom, you can have multiple devices in the halls or presentation areas, so on and so forth. There's been a large number of projects that have been rolled out this year, and it's the smart antennas that have been used. And you, you end up with absolutely no issues in a very dense environment. So the other thing we've just started to touch on is this requirement for multi-gigabit ports and also higher end PoE. As the 
the capabilities of the devices have gone up in terms of bandwidth and processing so is the requirement for power uh, and hence speed as speed as well so this is just a table which is showing the uh, the requirements for different uh, cabling technologies and multi gigabit speed technologies so some cabling systems will support all the way up to 10 gigabit others will not so you can use this table to work out whether or not uh, your your currently installed cabling will support multi gig ports obviously you can see here if you've got say up to 2.5 gig or up to 5 gig you've not really got too much of a problem even with cat 5e the cat 5e does not support 10 gig the poe is the, <clears throat> quite often referred to now as poe plus um, plus the so-called bt spec as well so originally on earlier access points and uh, the current lower end ax devices you could get away with standard poe but when you go to the higher end access points so like the 650s yes, you also have a requirement for much more poe power and here we have a switch that we have just launched that basically provides what you want in terms of multi-gig wide connectivity and higher poe supply so there are two switches Maybe I'll take a sip the family is the xs 1930 they're nebula flex switches or, or locally smart managed and there's an xs 1930 which is a non-poe device and there's an xs 1930 hp which is a poe device so that poe device it has uh, eight poe plus plus ports and it has the full 375 watts of power that you'd have in a in a 24 port switch but that is spread over eight ports and so you can see the difference in the per port poe rating the dash uh, 12 hp has two additional uplink ports copper uplink ports multi-gig uh, uplink ports and two sfp plus 10 gig ports the the dash 10 version of the switch just has the two sfp plus ports from a trunk point of view and it has eight multi-gig ports so when we say multi-gig what we mean is that it's uh, 100 megabits one gig 2.5 gig 5 gig and 10 gig all on copper these switches have been designed for ultra quiet cooling operation so they've got um, temperature feedback to control the fans they've got a simple display to show you the power status whether it's powered up whether or not it's uh, cloud managed via nebula or whether or not it's uh, standalone managed and it has a locator light you can also reset the configuration and you can restore the last known good custom configuration so very nice switches they've got individual leds and showing the port speed and so on and so forth but they're a very nice switch essentially for wi-fi 6. so it's quite useful to know what the competition is so we've got uh, a table here which goes over the competition what we offer and what the competition offer and this is more for people that have to um, raise quotes for customers and so on and so forth we can see our feature list here which is expanded on the next slide these slides um, will be sent to you so i wouldn't worry about making notes and so on and so forth so the previous one was the the dash 10 hp so this is the sorry the dash 10 this is the non-poe switch and then over here we've got the the 12 hp poe device and you can see how high the poe budget is on our switch substantially higher than any of the other competitors so what we've done now is just put a little a little table up of all the devices that are currently available uh, one of the things that's worth noting it, these are uk parts list part numbers so you can order against these uh, part numbers so we do sell things in triple packs and sometimes five packs so there's a cost advantage in that so we've just put um, these part numbers up there so people can um, see what they need to order against uh, same thing applies to the multi-gig um, switch as well As I said earlier on, it's no good me pretending to be a, a mathematician or, or anything like that. So I've just put, if people are interested, you can follow these links to what is um, essentially creating the higher efficiency, the higher speeds, and the sort of technology that's being used uh, to get these higher rates. And I've just put some links here. Spectral efficiency is probably the first one that's worth reading, and that explains the key concepts and then you move on to the OFDMA and quadrature, quadrature amplitude modulation as well making a mouthful of that so 
got to some questions and answers. If I was going to, um, if people have got questions about the products and so on and so forth, I can go and uh, wait around for a little while and, and ask, I'll try and answer anything. If I can't answer it, I can obviously reach out to the product managers. Uh, what I would say is all these devices now, they are available. They've been coming out over the last six months, but now we've reached the point where they're all out. All the chipsets have been released by the manufacturers. The multi-gig switches are now available and orderable. And essentially now you can build a very high-end Wi-Fi 6 solution using the multi-gig switches. If you just want to use uh, the NWA devices with one gig and the WAX 510D, you can, you can carry on using them on one gig switches, standard PoE, that's why we've brought them out. They will still have some of those features to do with power saving, uh, finer grained resource scheduling, so a, uh, a nicer sort of customer and client side experience. Um, if you need to go higher speed and perhaps higher density, then you will need uh, the multi-gig switches. And as you've seen there, we've got the XS 1930, which takes care of that. So you can group those switches, perhaps uh, in a particular part of a building, it may not be appropriate to have Wi-Fi 6, so you can carry on using a mixture of GS 1920 V2 switches for uh, AC Wave 2 type access points. And then in areas that require perhaps high density and high throughput, you know, a conference hall or a specialist meeting room, you can implement Wi-Fi 6 along with the XS 1930 switch. Uh, also need to mention to people, don't forget the MSP program. Uh, it's msp.sizer.com that has advantages to your Nebula licensing and, and product purchases. So please don't forget that if you haven't applied already. And um, just thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I will wait around if there's any questions and thank you very much. As I say, have a good day. And um, my name is Nigel Canning. My email address is nigel.canning at zizor.co.uk if you need anything. Um, I can see quite people on the list that I know already, but you've got my contact details. So I'll wait around for a while and answer any questions. And uh, thank you very much indeed.